Okay, doke. So let's uh, pick up where we left off last time. Um, so remember, we were coming up with a another way to characterize compact sets, this time using closed sets instead of open sets. Um, and so I talked about this finite intersection property. That means that uh, a set is uh, the finite uh, intersection property means that uh, if you have a collection of sets such that any um, finite collection collection of them has a non-empty uh, intersection, then that's finite intersection. Uh, and so the theorem uh, is that a set is compact, space is compact if and only if every collection of closed sets having the finite intersection property, the intersection of all the sets in that collection is not empty. Okay. And um, the, the, the place where we use it all the time in topology is when you have a, a nested sequence of um, closed sets in a, in, in a compact space, then you can conclude that the intersection of this is not empty. And, uh, uh, for example, uh, improving the, uh, it's a, it gives you a really nice way to prove the uncountability of the reals without using any of the algebra of the reals just by using the topological properties. Okay. Um, so why is this, why is it, oh. oh, here we go. Sorry, I need to prove this somewhere. Okay, um, so the proof follows from just the following observation. So if you have a collection of subsets of a space, then consider the, the collection of the complements of those sets. And the reason why we do that, of course, is because if we have a collection of open sets, then their complements is going to be a collection of closed sets. Um, and then from the De Morgan uh, laws, it follows that um, if you have a cover of X, uh, that can only happen if the collection, uh, if the intersection of all the, um, the complements is empty. And if you have a finite subcollection covering X, it can only happen if and only if the intersection of the corresponding elements of complements is empty. Okay, so look at the definition of compact again. Remember, uh, a space is contact, compact if given any collection of open sets that cover, anytime you have a covering of X by open sets, you have a finite subcovering. Okay, so let's first take the contrapositive of that. Uh, so that means, uh, given any collection of open sets, uh, if no finite subcollection of that collection covers X, then the initial collection cannot cover X. Okay, so that's equivalent to that. Now just put that in terms of complements. Uh, instead of a collection of open sets, look at the collection of closed sets. Uh, if every finite subcollection of elements of, um, of that collection is non-empty, then the intersection of all the, of all the uh, elements is non-empty. So this is uh, this really is the finite in, the intersection property is really just the, the equivalent statement to um, the uh, finite covering property, the property of open sets. Uh, but already we've seen how that um, 
just that definition of compact is kind of easy to use. We've kind of proved a lot of things in a, in a kind of very straightforward way. And this also, uh, this alternative definition also gives us uh, a nice thing. Okay, um, so let's now consider the real line and think about compact subspaces of the real line. Um, so again, we want to generalize what we're talking about. So instead of, um, uh, so let's just talk about any space which is simply ordered having the least upper bound property. Okay, so remember when we did connectedness, we just wanted um, simply ordered having the least upper bound plus that you can stick an element in between any two. Uh, okay, so just the fact that you have the least upper bound property means that in the order topology, every closed interval of X is compact. Okay, so let's just go through the usual rigmarole. Um, so let's say we have a closed interval and let's say we have an open covering. Um, so let X be any element of this interval, which is at B. And I claim that there is a Y between X and B and not X, not equal to X, such that that closed interval XY can be covered by at most two elements of A. Um, why is that the case? Well, uh, so we choose X. Now, if X has a successor, I, you know, like uh, in, in the order you have X and then Y, and there's no element between X and Y, uh, then the closed interval X, Y just consists of the two elements X and Y. Right? And so if, if you've got a, a cover, then you must have at least, at most, you can have two sets, and one with X in it, one with Y. Uh, what happens if uh, X doesn't have a successor? Well, um, if we look at X, uh, there's, an, uh, there's a cover, there's an element containing X. Right, since we have a cover of AB. So therefore, uh, at X, there must be some ball we can put around X. Okay. And that which, which is contained within that open cover. Well, once we have that, then we have a Y that's inside that ball. And so that, in that case, we have uh, only the one element then that cover that X, Y. So this isn't really saying very much at all. Okay, so if we've got if we've got X, there must be some ball which is contained within one element of the cover, say AI, and so we just prove we just use a Y that's inside there. And and the only reason why this might not work is if that ball was empty. And then the only reason why that ball would be empty is if uh, X had an immediate successor. Okay. So let's have a look then at the set of points for which the closed interval A to Y can be covered by finitely many elements of A. It's not empty, right? Because we just proved here that there at least has to be one element in that, in that, in that set. Okay. Um, so this is a subset of our 
uh, simply or it's it. We have this least upper bound property. Therefore, this um, set has a least upper bound. And let, let that be C. Obviously, what we want to do is we want to show that C equals B. If C equals B, then we're done. Um, so three things. C is not the, the this set C is non-empty. Well, I've already talked about that. Um, C has to be in that interval A B. Right? Because how could it not be? Well, it could be what would happen if C was greater than B and B would be a bit better bound. So C is in the interval. Um, and C itself, little c, has to be in big C. Right? Because, um, uh, how does this picture help? Um, Why does C have to be in capital C? So there has to be a C. Um, oh. Turn my lights off. Why does C have to be, so why does uh, A to C have to be covered by many things? Um, well, let's say it's not. Then, um, then we can just choose some element. We, we look at the, uh, uh, the collection of A that hits C. I think this is supposed to help, and I don't, I'm not seeing how. It, the, the thing is, we could just add in one more element. If C wasn't covered by A, all we'd need would be one more element, then we just uh, 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 we, we, we know that A covers the whole interval, in, in, uh, uh, interval A, B, so C has to be in some. Um, element of, of that collection A, we'll just throw that in and it's still finite. So that's that case. Can't, can't quite remember why that picture helps us. But anyway. Um, and then by a similar kind of argument, uh, C actually equals B. Uh, again, because if C was uh, less than B, then again we could we could have uh, we could use if C was less than B, then by by step one we would have a Y that was between C and B, and then again by just adding that. Uh, that element of A, uh, we would get a cover of something which was bigger than A to C, and we'd be in A, B, and it would still be finite. Okay, so we got there eventually. Um, so that means, in particular, every closed interval in R is compact because uh, as that least upper bound property. What about Rm? Okay, a, and the theorem is a subspace of Rn is compact if and only if it is closed and it is bounded in the Euclidean metric or the square metric. 
Um, okay, we don't have to prove it for both because we know that the topologies are homeomorphic because we have that we can there's that inequality where we can um, uh, stick the distance of one between two factors of the other. So let's just prove it for the uh, the square metric. So it's infinitely. So what happens if the space is compact? We've got to show that it's closed and bounded. Well, it's closed because we already proved that in theorem 26.3 last thing. And it's bounded. Uh, and this is this trick that I showed you before. Uh, you just um, uh, I don't think that's supposed to be zero. That's supposed to be an A. So if you just take any element of A and then just uh, look at um, balls of radius N, that has to cover A, uh, that's an open cover, so there has to be a finite subcover. And so the largest then N can give you a, a, a bound for that. Oh, it doesn't matter. Zero works just as good. Right. Yeah, it doesn't really, really doesn't matter. What about going the other way? Suppose that we've got a, a space which is bounded and closed. Why is it compact? Well, the reason why that is, uh, if it's bounded, then uh, there exists an M such that A can be put inside a big enough cube, right? So just, just think M, just think of the diameter, of the, the bound that we can put on A, which is the maximum distance between any two points in that. And then if we add in the distance from some random point in A to the origin, that gives us an M and then the cube, this cube here then is, uh, contains it. Well, this is a compact space, right? Because we should prove that an interval, a closed interval is compact and this is a finite product of a compact space. So this is compact. And so this is a closed subset of a compact space so therefore it has to be compact. So that was pretty easy. And so here are some, uh, this is a, a nice example of a compact space, the unit sphere or the closed unit ball, uh, both compact. And it's easy to come up with examples which are not compact. So A here is not, uh, compact, right, because it's closed, but it's not bounded. Uh, this part of the um, topology sine curve is not compact. It's bounded, but it's not closed. There we go. Now, I don't think did you, uh, we don't prove this in calc. Did you prove this in advanced calc? Yeah. Okay. So it's just nice how simple the theorems become to prove oh, yeah. in topology. So the extreme value theorem says that if you've got a, uh, a continuous function where this is a, a compact and this is an ordered set, uh, then uh, the function attains its extrema, i.e. there exists points C and D in X such that F of X lies between F of C and F of D. Okay, well, the first thing is, if X is compact, then the image of X in uh, Y is compact. Um, so that means F of the image of X has the largest 
element. Because otherwise, if you just look at this cover here, uh, uh, these intervals from minus infinity to y for all elements of the image of x, that will give you an open cover of x of f of x. Um, but since f of x is compact, it has to have a finite subcover. So that means we have a whole bunch of intervals minus infinity y1 minus infinity y2, etc. Well, we just consider minus infinity yn. Let's consider the largest endpoint there. Uh, we have that that contains uh, uh, f of x, but that's obviously a contradiction, right? Because y of n has to be a point in f of x, but it's not in the cover. So that's a contradiction. So that shows that the image has the largest element. Well, it has the largest element, then it has to equal f of d for some point in x. And then you can do the same argument uh, to show that it's the smallest element. <laughs> That's just like trivially easy, really. Uh, uniform continuity is not much harder. Um, uh, so before we, we deal with uniform continuity, just let me remind you of a couple of definitions. So if we've got a, a point and a non-empty subspace, uh, then we can have, think of the distance from a point to the subspace as just the infimum of the distances from X to points in A. And you can think of the diameter of a bounded subset as then as the soup of all the possible distances of points in A. Okay, so uh, the useful lemma we need is that for a fixed subspace A, the function d x of A is a continuous function of x. So we fix a subspace A, we have a point x, x varies, and that gives us a function. Function. Now, why is that continuous? Well, you just use the tri good old triangle inequality. So the distance between x and the subspace A always has to be less than or equal to the distance between x and any point A in A. Then the triangle inequality says that this is less than or equal distance between x and y the distance between y and a, that's just that. So we just subtract the distance from y to a to both sides. And so we get the distance from x to a minus the distance from x to y. Right, that's going to be less than to equal the distance between x and a. In particular, it's going to be true for the infima, which is exactly the distance between, uh, do I need to do that? That should have been, a, that should be a y, shouldn't it? Yeah. Because I move this over here. So I'm replacing distance from y of r to a as the, as the, uh, so, so that has to be true for that has to be true for all a. Therefore, it's true for the infimum, and that's just the distance between y and a. And then I just do one more bit of algebra. And so the distance between x and a minus the distance between y and a is less than or equal to the distance between x and y. And now we can just use the epsilon delta um, definition of continuity. So given epsilon greater than zero, if we let delta equal epsilon, then whenever this is less than delta, 
this is going to be less than x one. And so that's that's continuity. Uh, and so to prove it, we use the LeBay number lemma. Have you? I don't know if you did that in the right. Um, so if we have an open covering of a metric space, if X is compact, then there exists a delta greater than zero. And that number is called a LeBay number for the covering, such that for every subset of X having diameter less than delta, there exists an element of A containing it. Uh, so you have some space and we have some covering. Covering of our space. And so there is a delta which looks like maybe here. Uh, well, well the, the, there exists a delta such that every subspace of diameter less than delta is going to be contained only in one element of, of the covering. So that's the main, so that's the Lebay number for the covering. Um, and that's not so hard to prove. Firstly, assume that the whole space is not an element of, of the covering, because otherwise any number will be a Lebay number. Okay. So if we have a covering, then we have a finite covering. So let, let's, let's have that finite covering A1 through An, and let's consider the complement then of that open cover. And so we're going to define a function then from our space x to r by uh, f of x is the average distance of x from these complement sets. Okay. Uh, so note in particular that this has to be a non-zero function. Right, because um, firstly, it's well defined, right, because X is not an element of A, so that means the empty set is not in our collection of complements, right, because that would screw us up. Um, so that means given any X, it has to lie in some AI because the, it's, a, it's a covering. So therefore, it's not in the complement. Since A is open, there exists a little ball around it, a little epsilon ball. And so the distance from X to C is at least epsilon. So F of X has to be at least epsilon on N. So this is a strictly positive function. It's continuous, so therefore it has a minimum value. Let's say that minimum value is delta. And that's going to then work. Uh, because if we choose Let's say, let's, let's try and now prove the lemma. So let's say we have a subset B having diameter less than delta. And let's choose a point X naught in that subset. Well, delta is going to be less than or equal to F of X zero, just by definition of the minimum which is going to be less than or equal to the maximum distance of x naught from those complements, right? Because remember, f is the average, and so the average has to lie between the minimum value and the maximum value. So f of x naught is less than or equal to the maximum possible distance, but since it's a finite collection, it actually 
has to, there has to actually be some M. So uh, delta uh, is less than or equal to the distance from X naught to CM. But that means X naught is wholly, uh, uh, AM contains this ball centered X naught of radius delta. But then within that ball is the subset B. So B is contained within A. Okay. So now we're ready to prove. Now uniform continuity becomes almost a free, right? Once we have this related number. So remember what uniformly continuous means. So you've got a function from one metric space to another metric space, and it's uniformly con continuous if given an epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta greater than zero such that for every point x naught and x1, uh, the distance between x naught and x1 less than delta means that the distance of the images is less than epsilon. And the uniform continuity theorem is that if you have a continuous map on a compact metric space, then F has to be uniformly continuous. Prove it like three lines or whatever. Okay, given epsilon greater than zero, let's cover Y by balls of radius epsilon on two. So anything within those balls are going to be distance epsilon apart. Take the inverse images of these balls, and that gives you an open covering of X. Choose delta to be the vague number for the covering A, and you're done. Right? Because by definition, right, a set here that um, is less than delta apart uh, is going to lie entirely within one of these pre images. And then when we push that image back to the thing, it's going to go into the, the ball of radius epsilon. Doing hardly anything. Mm -hmm. And so let's finish off by doing the uncountability of the wheels, which again is going to kind of be shocking in, in how little we seem to be doing. And this is just using the order property of the reals. It's nothing to do with anything about decimal expansions or binary expansions or whatever. Okay, so let's define an isolated point. So a point X is an isolated point if the singleton X is open. Here's the theorem. Let X be a non-empty compact Hausdorff space. If X has no isolated points, then X is uncountable. So, kind of kind of seems kind of strange when you say it like that, but I had no isolated point. So it's kind of funny how you say, okay, we don't have anything of this, so therefore it has to be uncountable. Um, I guess I guess the thing that's eliminating is just like finite collection of points.
Okay, so the first thing we have to prove is a separation lemma. So already we've seen these separation lemmas are really important. So the idea of a separation lemma, lemma is we have two objects and we want to be able to surround those objects by disjoint open sets. And it just happens that whenever you can do that, that turns out to be powerful to be able to prove lots of things. So here's this separation now. So given any non-empty open set and any element of X, there exists a non-empty open set V contained in U such that X is not in the closure of V. And so this is really hardly saying anything at all, right? Because X may or not be in U, it just says, You've got a, an open set U and you've got some point X, okay? Then there exists some open, open space, y, uh, uh, what is it called? V, so that V is in U and its closure is not in X. So that's hardly anything. So now why can that be? Okay. So let's choose any point Y, which is in U and not equal to X. Okay. So this is where we need no isolated points, right? Because the only thing we could go wrong is if X wasn't an isolated point, then U would equal the, the set X we could find no y. Okay. But given that there's no isolated points, then every open set has to contain at least two points. So even in the worst case, you can find a point not equal to x. Okay. Now you use Hausdorff. Uh, because there, it's Hausdorff, you can put open sets around x and y, which is disjoint. And then you just let V equal um, the neighborhood around Y intersecting U. And that does it for you. Okay. And amazingly, that's all you need to prove that it's uncountable. And the way we're going to show it's uncountable is we're going to show that any function from the positive integers to x cannot be subjective. Okay. So uh, if we've got such a function, that means we can just define a sequence of points in x where xn equals f of n. So we want to show that there has to exist uh, an X such as um, there's no N such as F of N, F of N equals X. Okay, so we just kind of use induction. So we start by uh, let our first open set be the entire set X. And so that means we can find a non-empty open set V1 containing X, such that X1 is not in the closure of V1. And now we just repeat by induction. Uh, in, in general, given an open non-empty uh, set Vn minus one, we want to find Vn. Well, we can choose a Vn such that it's contained within the previous open set and its closure does not include um, the point xn. And so notice by construction, the closure of vn also doesn't include x1 through xn. Okay, so now we use the finite intersection property. Right, because so, now we've got by ourselves a chain of closed um, 
subsets which has the finite intersection property, right? Because at each step, the end is, is non empty. So, since uh, since X is compact, there has to exist an X which is in the infinite intersection. And this X can't be in the image of F. Um, just by, by construction, right? Because if X equals some X N, um, uh, you can take this step one more one more further. And that's it. That's pretty. So all, you, all you're doing is just saying, you know, you start off with the interval zero to one, you just say, you just pick a point, find an open interval, pick a point, find an open interval, such so the closure doesn't include that. And then just by that finite intersection property, there has to be a point left over. So you can't count them all. And so by corollary, every closed interval in R is uncountable. Okay. So that takes us to the break. Does everything know to make us possible? So, what do you mean? I don't know. Should it have been easier or harder if we tried to show that X is probable when there's only an isolated point? Uh, if X is countable, I guess so. Um, No. Uh, so, so how how would you want to prove it? Sorry. So I don't know. I was just wondering if this method wasn't exactly the easiest. Yeah. It seemed like we would use octopi. Maybe in the statement seems both that and seemingly right? I don't know. No, it's not entirely clear to me. So the main thing is like you've got a subjection and you've got a map and it can't be a subjection. So So you're just basically looking at the image of F and you're just showing that there has to be something left over. Anyway. So where are we where are we at? Okay, so we've still got local compactness and and, and the idea of limit point compactness. Okay. And then we, we get start getting into after that separate more into uh, separation axioms. So local compactness is useful because um, if you've got a topologically topological group which is locally compact, then you've got a nicely defined integration on it. So um, any locally compact topological group has a integration on it. Well, it has a measure which is group invariant. Yeah, so 
really swing around the community and do not mean to follow you the abstract algebra to measure theory. Because you don't really usually think of integration as group invariant, but right, if you've got if you've got if you've got some function and you shift it horizontally, you don't really change, you don't change the area. Right, so the, the integral between minus infinity and infinity of f of x is the integral between minus infinity of f x plus a. So, and in a sense, there's kind of like only one way to do integration, which is Lebesgue integration, of course. Not really integration. But it's interesting because that means that you've got, right, you've got an integration on multiplicative reals. Right, so, so there's, there's an integration such that f integral of fx uh, sorry, that to be zero to infinity equals the integral of zero to infinity f of kx. Right. Which is just, it's actually just normal integration when you just divide by x. So the length. The length of the interval between A and B is log B on A. It doesn't, doesn't change right if you if you stretch it out. But we won't get into that. <laughs>